Hello. We're excited to talk about our complicated relationship. Well, I'm, I'm going to do the actual talking. But my partners are here with me. In fact, they come everywhere with me. Some I've known since birth, some I've picked up along the way, and I share them with everyone I meet. So who are these partners? They're the 38 trillion microbes up here with me, covering just about every surface of my body inside and out. Think about that for a moment. 38 trillion tiny autonomous creatures up here with me. That's 5,000 times more microbes in my body than there are humans on Earth. And when it comes to the ratio of my cells to my partner's cells, well, it's about one to one. So for every human cell that makes me me, I have a microbial partner. We've known that these bugs were there for a long time, and we call them our microbiome. But we've, we've shed them in our feces for a long time, and, and we know about them, but it wasn't until the early 2000s that we began to understand that these are a community of organisms that interact with each other and with us. So this community of microorganisms living within us is managing to mess around with lots of our biological functions. So in 2009, the federal government created the Human Microbiome Project which earmarked federal funds to fund research to map the human microbiome in healthy people. And since then, scientists have been working to understand the ways that the microbiome impact health and disease. The microbiome is a diverse community, right? It contains parasites, fungi, viruses, and bacteria. And bacteria are by far the majority of the community. And there's great diversity within the species of bacteria within the microbiome. And there are particular classes of microbes within the microbiome that are associated with a healthy microbiome. Now, we tend to think of bacteria as, as always being bad. And certainly, there are professional pathogens like salmonella that causes food poisoning, or the bugs that cause tuberculosis or cholera. But the bacteria within a healthy microbiome are good bacteria, and the bacteria develop along with us. Now, I use the term relationship to describe our interactions with our microbiome, because in a relationship, there's a give and take. So let's explore this give and take between us and our microbial partners. What are they doing for me right now? Well, right now, they are making some amino acids and vitamins and fatty acids that are important nutrients and that help to regulate the function of my gut. They're um, helping me digest some foods that my own digestive enzymes can't handle. And they're taking up space on my gut lining to prevent yeast from overgrowing and to prevent some pathogenic bacteria from uh, finding a place to stay. And these are functions that happen every day. We are constantly being supported by our gut microbiome. Well, so what do they get from us? Dinner. How does the cheeseburger we eat turn into fuel for our body? Well, first our digestive enzymes work on the food, and then our gut microbiome makes a meal of the leftovers. So what are these leftovers? They're dietary fiber or complex carbohydrates, right? So we tend to think of uh, the phrase, you are what you eat, right? And of course, we're not a cheeseburger, and we're not we're not oatmeal, right? But I think that phrase resonates with us to some extent, right? If we eat things that are healthy, we will be healthy. And if we eat things that are unhealthy, we will be unhealthy. Now, I must admit that in my relationship with my microbiome, I am often not the best partner. <laughs> when I'm stressed out, I want fat and sugar, right? The plate of wings hold the celery. But when we eat food that feeds our microbiome, foods that are rich in dietary fiber and complex carbohydrates, the good bacteria stick around. And when we eat foods that's rich in fat and sugar, like I like to, sometimes the good bacteria go away and we change the diversity of the community. And in fact, a recent study showed that sugar itself can impair the ability of some microbes to attach to the gut lining. And these are the good guys. So, 
how do we damage our microbiome? Well, one of the most common ways we damage our microbiome is by taking antibiotics. Right? And of course, if you have a raging bacterial infection, you should take your antibiotics, and you should take all of them. <laughs> but you know, we're exposed to antibiotics in the food we eat, we're exposed to antibiotics in soaps and in plastics, and I'm guessing most of us in this room have been prescribed antibiotics for something that wasn't even a bacterial infection. I remember when I was in high school taking antibiotics for recurring bronchitis, right? And the antibiotics did absolutely nothing. I was later diagnosed with asthmatic bronchitis. No bacterial infection. So all of this exposure to antibiotics can, can harm our gut microbiome community, it can reduce its ability to function as a barrier, and it can lead to antimicrobial resistance. So what about recovery? One course of antibiotics is enough to change the gut microbiome. But luckily, this is usually temporary, and the gut microbiome recovers within a few weeks to months after stopping treatment. However, multiple rounds of antibiotics or long-term antibiotic use can lead to lasting, if not permanent, damage to the microbiome. So, so what? It's just bacteria in my gut. Well, before we get into so what, there is an association with the microbiome and many different human diseases. But cause has not yet been proven in many cases. Right? Human studies are hard. We're outbred. Right? We have different genetics. We have different environments. We all eat different diets. We come from different places. And so these are all confounding variables in human studies. So we have to interpret the results with a bit of caution. But, you know, we're at the early stages of understanding all of the amazing things our microbiome does when it's healthy and all of the potential roles it plays in disease. So let's explore some areas of current research. So we have an immune system. And the function of our immune system is to recognize things that are potentially harmful and to eliminate them. Well, I just told you that our gut is full of bacteria, but our immune system isn't trying to fight them. Right? And so, when we think about uh, the interactions of the immune system with the microbiome, we know that the microbiome actually trains the immune system to be more selective about what it reacts to. We don't want to react to everything that comes through the gut. We have to eat. So, one of the hypotheses for the reason that there was an increase in peanut allergy in children is that children were not exposed to peanuts in that important time when tolerance is developed in the immune system. A recent study also demonstrated that children before the age of seven who received multiple rounds of antibiotics had an increased risk of food allergy. So diversity is also important in our community. We want to have lots of different microbes. So how do you achieve diversity? Well, I can tell you it's by going outside and playing in the dirt. It's not by sitting inside staring at a screen. There's evidence that exposure to pets early in life actually helps reduce the incidence of food allergy. And we know that we share our microbiome with people and pets that we come in contact with. So it's likely that our pets actually help diversify our microbiome. And so there's evidence that the microbiome is also associated with some common inflammatory diseases, such as eczema and asthma. And so it's pretty clear that the microbiome is important in training our immune system to be a little bit less reactive. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is an emotional relationship, right? I think most relationships have an emotional component, and the ability of the gut to influence the sensory and emotional uh, activity of the brain is called the gut-brain axis. And we know now that the microbiome is an important component in that line of communication. Studies have compared the microbiomes of patients with and without major depression and found fundamental differences. So more studies are needed with larger sample sizes to determine if manipulation of the microbiome can reduce symptoms of depression. But a few studies have shown that taking probiotics, which are live cultures of bacteria that can help to influence the diversity of, of the microbial community, some of those patients saw benefit, reduction of symptoms of depression. Time will tell the mood-altering mechanisms of our microbiome. So, I mentioned there's a lot of bacteria in our gut, right? And it's pretty crowded in there. 
And that crowding is important because it means there's no room for unwanted guests. But however, when we take antibiotics, uh, unwanted guests can come in and find a spot and stick around. An example of one of these unwanted guests is the bacterium called Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. So the scenario is this. A patient has antibiotics and develops a bacterial infection, C. diff, which causes severe diarrhea, and the treatment is more antibiotics until recently. So doctors began to think outside of the box, or rather, outside of the pill bottle. C. diff occurs because of damage to the microbiome, so doctors asked if we can restore a healthy microbiome, can we cure C. diff infection? And the answer was yes. So how do you restore a healthy microbiome? Through a process called fecal microbiota transplantation, or fecal transplant. And yes, it is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Feces from a patient with a healthy microbiome are instilled in the colon of a patient with C. diff. The microbiome is restored to a healthy state. The C. diff is competed out, and the infection is cured. The cure rates are about 85%. So I hope from these three examples, right, so talking about allergy, talking about depression, and talking about C. diff infection, that it's clear that the microbiome plays an important role in our overall health and well-being. Now, looking to the future, it remains to be seen if manipulation of the microbiome can be a, a therapeutic strategy in many different human diseases. Now, new pharmaceuticals are slow and expensive. Poop is cheap and abundant. <laughs> so there is a potential revolution to our understanding of human disease through the study of the microbiome. And I gotta say, I have a gut feeling that the next several years of work is going to be really exciting. Uh. So, It's official. We're in a relationship with our microbiome, and there's no getting out of it. We are not what we eat. It's clear that what we put into our body, our environment, and our stress level, all of these impact our microbiome. And we tend to think of self-care as only think being about mental health. But given the important role of our microbiome and health and well-being, self-care, too, should take into account this important relationship. So we should be a good partner to our microbiome. We should feed our partners with good things, manage our stress, take care of our microbiome. And in return, our partners, our community of microbes, our microbiome will take care of us. Thank you.